Thus far we've learned how to create measures of average uh, portfolio performance over time, um, how to create risk-adjusted measures of its performance, either with respect to total, uh, systematic, or idiosyncratic risk, as well as how to create um, either percentage or even dollar-based comparisons uh, on a risk-adjusted basis, as well as how to detect market timing ability in a manager. Uh, for this last discussion, what we'll focus on is the ability to decompose a manager's total performance relative to a benchmark into two uh, main clusters. The allocation between uh, different asset classes or sectors and the selection of individual securities within each asset class or sector. Um, these, of course, are separate competencies and it makes sense uh, to evaluate a manager's ability to do one or the other, even though both contribute uh, to performance. So this is going to be with regard to a benchmark. So the first thing that we need to do is actually uh, define a benchmark uh, portfolio for our uh, manager's performance. Now, the CFA Institute suggests the following characteristics for uh, a good benchmark. and uh, these are good ones, therefore, to follow. Uh, first of all, a benchmark should be specified in advance. In other words, it should be something that uh, is known both to the investor and the manager before the investment process begins, um, and is consistent over the evaluation. Uh, second, the benchmark should be appropriate. In other words, it's actually consistent with the investment style um, and area of expertise. It wouldn't, for example, make sense to use a uh, bond portfolio to measure an equity manager's portfolio. Um, and it might not make sense to use, let's say, a stock index to measure the performance of a long-short equity strategy. So the benchmark has to be similar uh, to what the actual investment process involves. The benchmark should be measurable. In other words, you can actually calculate the return on the benchmark um, on a reasonably frequent basis. Uh, obviously, the more frequent, the better. Uh, so something like an equity benchmark, uh, an equity index would be uh, very easy to measure. And if you had a much more sort of complex uh, and perhaps liquid investment process in something like uh, real estate or fine art, um, those would be much harder to measure, but uh, one would still have to do the best one could in selecting a benchmark that is uh, at least the most measurable of possible candidate ones. Uh, the benchmark should be unambiguous. In other words, it should be known uh, what is in the benchmark portfolio and how much of it there is, what the weights are. Uh, so, for example, with fine art, uh, it wouldn't really do to say that my benchmark portfolio is some fine art. Uh, you'd need to say how much of, a, of each type, uh, what are the weights, and what are the categories, uh, perhaps as finely down as possible. If you think about the analog of, let's say, the S&P 500 as a benchmark portfolio, uh, you know exactly the weights of each of the stocks, because it's a market cap weighted portfolio. Um, at each time. And you certainly know all the stocks that are in that portfolio at each time. Uh, so the more unambiguous you can make your benchmark, the better. Uh, the benchmark should be reflective of current investment opinions. In other words, it should actually reflect uh, the knowledge of the securities, factor exposures in the uh, portfolio. And that's sort of on the manager to be aware of. Uh, but if their process, let's say, is something related to uh, fundamental valuation, uh, then perhaps the benchmark should reflect a value tilt. Uh, the benchmark should be one that the manage manager is held accountable to. Um, in other words, it's one that the manager agrees to be benchmarked and evaluated on performance uh, relative to. And finally, ideally, a benchmark should be investable. 
uh, because remember the big purpose of the benchmark is simply to show uh, what the alternative to having this portfolio manager run your assets will be. Um, in other words, if you beat the benchmark, uh, do you beat it by enough to justify the fees that you charge? Because uh, if you don't, then uh, the benchmark would be most credible if the investor could just say, I'll just hold the benchmark instead. Thank you very much. Um, so something like a traded index would be great, like the S&P 500. Uh, something like a non-traded index um, would be less. Now, once we have a benchmark in place, what we want to do is we want to calculate the return on the benchmark and on the portfolio under management. And then what we want to do is decompose the difference in the total returns between the two into these two effects. The allocation effect, which is essentially just deviations from benchmark weights across sectors or asset classes and a selection effect, which is the security choice within uh, the sector or the asset class. Now, to introduce a bit of notation, here's how we will measure uh, the performance of both our benchmark and our managed portfolio uh, by either uh, asset class or by sector. So over each uh, asset class or sector, one through N, we will calculate the return on the benchmark portfolio as the weight allocated to that sector or asset class by the benchmark uh, times the return of the assets within that asset class or sector in the benchmark. And similarly, we'll calculate the weight on the portfolio uh, as the sum over all the asset classes or all the sectors, depending on the level of which we're doing, at which we are doing the attribution analysis um, of the weights that that asset class or sector has in our portfolio times the returns of the securities in that asset class or uh, sector in our portfolio. This is essentially the same as calculating uh, portfolio returns for weighted combinations of individual assets as well. Here we're just sort of aggregating up individual asset returns um, to the sector or asset class, but of course those individual returns and calculating each particular sector return uh, would themselves probably be weighted by whatever um, allocation was made to those individual sectors. Now obviously when we look at the performance of any manager, really what we focus on is this difference in the return to the managed portfolio relative to the benchmark. Uh, this is where the idea of beating the market is uh, measured, if your benchmark happens to be the market. Uh, just, you know, did you actually beat your benchmark? Did your portfolio has a, have a higher return once you aggregate up all of your positions into sectors or into asset classes and then you sum up all your weights times the returns to each of those sectors or asset classes um, does your portfolio return beat the benchmark? And of course, we could express that as the sum of substituting in literally our definition for uh, the benchmark return as the sum of individual weights and returns and substituting our definition for the portfolio return as that sum of individual portfolio returns or of individual sector and or asset class returns, I should say. Uh, we then get this expression here. And then we can really take the summation out into parentheses because uh, if this is a good benchmark, it'll of course be over the same asset classes or sectors as our portfolio is. Um, if it's indeed an appropriate one. Uh, so then we can literally just sum up the differences in weighted in weight times performance within each sector or asset class for our portfolio minus the weight times the performance um, in the benchmark across all 
asset classes or sectors. So this is sort of the overall uh, performance of the manager relative to the benchmark. Obviously, we'd like a positive difference. Uh, if it's negative, that means the manager underperformed. If it's positive, that means the manager outperformed. But now what we want is we want actually to be able to say how much of it was due to the appropriate allocation between different asset classes or uh, sectors if we're talking about pure equity, and how much of it was due to selection uh, within each particular uh, asset class or uh, sector. How did you actually do it picking individual securities? And here's how we can do it. We can define the allocation effect for each uh, asset class or sector as the difference in the weights that our portfolio assigned and the benchmark assigned times the return in the benchmark. Now, intuitively, this makes sense, right? If, for example, this was a class uh, or equity sector that had good performance, Presumably, we'd want to overweight it, and in other words, uh, we would want to have a higher than benchmark weight in it. And if we did, that would be a good allocation decision. Uh, conversely, if this was a badly performing sector according to the benchmark, uh, we'd want to underweight it. And that would also be a good allocation decision. So if the return is positive, we want to over allocate, and the more positive, uh, the more so. And if the return were negative, we'd want to under allocate relative to the benchmark. And the more we did, uh, the better our allocation effect contribution for that particular asset class or sector would be. And for the selection effect, what we want to do is sort of the opposite. Let's just take the weights of our portfolio, hold those constant, and then see uh, whether the returns within that sector or asset class for our portfolio beat those in the benchmark. So in other words, what that means is for every weight that we've assigned, uh, do the securities that we've picked within that sector or asset class beat those in the benchmark? If they do, that means that we did a better job of individual security selection within that category uh, than the benchmark. And if you distribute in uh, these multiplications, you'll actually see that if you add these two up and then multiply both uh, weights by the return to the benchmark and you multiply both returns in the selection equation by the weight in the benchmark and you add them up, you actually see that what this comes to is exactly the allocation plus selection effect for each sector is literally the total abnormal performance relative to the benchmark for that sector. So we can literally say that by distributing the allocation uh, equation, we've got WPI. Let's just do it for sector I. So we'll omit the uh, I's from the subscript. We've got WP times RB minus WB times RB. That's the allocation part. And to that, we add the selection part. So we'll distribute this uh, multiplication in. So we've got WP times RP minus WP times RP. And of course, then this term, this WP times RB cancels with this WP times RB. And what we're left with when we do A plus S allocation plus selection is exactly WP RP minus WB RB. So that is our return relative to the benchmark uh, within each sector, and then it's just a matter of summing up 
um, across all sectors or, or asset classes. So you can see that mathematically this definition of allocation and selection uh, definitely does work out, and that is a way to decompose our total performance relative to the benchmark. But hopefully now you understand the intuition behind it, where for allocation we're holding returns constant relative to whatever the benchmark ones are, and looking at deviations and weights, because that's the allocation decision, picking how much weight you allocate to any sector or asset class. And for selection, we hold the weights constant uh, for our portfolio, and we look at the differences in returns, uh, the ones that we picked, individual securities in our portfolio, relative to the securities in the benchmark. And if we look at this graphically, we can actually see then, first of all, the return to the benchmark times the weights in the benchmark. You can use this as sort of the contribution to total returns of the benchmark or bogey portfolio. The difference in returns in our portfolio relative to uh, the benchmark multiplied by the weights in the portfolio, this part is the selection effect. Technically, it also includes this mixed origin. Square. Uh, that we can see how we could handle alternatively in uh, the next few slides. Uh, but the way that we've defined the selection effect here, um, it essentially also attributes it to selection. And then finally, allocation would be the difference in weights uh, times the benchmark return. So this is sort of a graphical uh, representation. And of course, remember, the total return uh, to our portfolio would be given by the return to the portfolio times the weight in the portfolio. So we can then see, first of all, how much bigger uh, the return to our portfolio was than the benchmark. The benchmark return is uh, sort of like this, the area of the blue square here. The portfolio return would be the area of this larger uh, shape here. And then we can see how this difference between the larger shape of our portfolio and the smaller shape of our benchmark or bogey uh, was divided up among the selection versus allocation effects. And the bigger the allocation effect, that means the better our manager is at picking um, asset classes, and the bigger the selection effect, the better our manager is at picking individual securities within those asset classes. Um, and of course, it's not always the case that both will be positive. It could be that your outperformance is driven by superior allocation, um, and it is actually reduced a bit by uh, subpar selection, or vice versa. But this way, you will actually know why you beat the benchmark. Was it because you were better at allocating capital among uh, equity sectors or asset classes in a multi-asset class portfolio? Uh, or was it by picking individual, as uh, individual securities within each sector or asset class?